climate change is real and we all need to do something about it. The ice cap of Greenland is thawing and disappearing and melting and it will affect all of us. The last 20 years in some places up to 30 meters of ice has been lost. So what do we do about it and what can we do? Well, Greenland has the answers and I will present the opportunities. And within the next five minutes, you will all have the answers. So please hang on. In 1990, the world population was 5.3 billion people, and predictions are stating that in the year 2100, it will be doubled to 10.8 billion people. Every single person on this planet needs a secure food and drinking water supply. So, the ice is melting so rapidly in Greenland that one cubic kilometer melts every day, and that is such a huge amount that it's really hard to visualize, but if you try to do so, one cubic kilometer, which is a square with one kilometer on each length, that equals thousand times thousand times thousand cubic meters per day, which is the same as one billion cubic meters per day, which equals one trillion liters per day, which is the same as 128 liters of fresh water per world capita every single day. And right now, this just goes out in the fjords and in the ocean every single day. But Greenland, we can deliver fresh drinking water to the whole world. The great opportunity for Greenland is that we have abundant natural resources and a lot of mining projects, potentials including green energy. We can also try to look at it a little bit simpler. For instance, can Greenlandic mud save the world? Glacial rock flower, and what is that? The fact that we are burning our forest all over the world to provide food is causing forest, biodiversity and nature to disappear. And you can use the soil for farmland once, twice or maybe three times, and then you have to burn more forests. We release a huge amount of CO2 in the atmosphere at the same time, and it's a very bad circle, which again tricks the climate change and melts the ice in Greenland and everywhere else. But we don't need to blast off the top of a mountain or build processing plants. We can simply just take the mud and transport it away. And as you can see, glacial rock flour just pour down in abundant levels every day, so the rock flour and the silt is crossed to tiny na nanoparticles by the weight of the retreating ice sheets, which deposit roughly one billion tons per year. The rock glacial flour, rock dust, or the sediments contains a reincorporating all the good minerals, which creates more and better fertile soils by returning minerals to the soil, which has been lost by erosion, leaking, and or over farming. So in this way, Greenland could improve food security and with the help of, and help the economic imbalances, which is partly caused by an uneven distribution of good quality farmland across the world. And measurements indicate that the new crops are better to absorb CO2 and, and grows better and potentially it is more sustainable alternative to conventional fertilizers. So Greenland can actually help to save forest, climate, biodiversity and lower the emissions at the same time. This particular uh, innovative cooperation and example uh, of a very early stage project is led by the Greenlandic professor Minik Rosing, together with scientists, universities and farmers. In 2021, the government of Greenland has decided to suspend exploration for oil and gas, so Nuna Oil changes its purpose and became Nuna Green. And the company will now work with renewable energy and green transition, and the company has previously been a non-operative partner in exploration and exploitation licenses for oil and gas on the Greenland shelf. So Greenland is a front runner in this as well. We are also constructing three new international airports in Greenland. By the end of the next year, we will be better connected to the world. And if you want to learn more about hydropower resources potential, please reach out to us and have a look at hydropower.gl. Greenland is also a wonderful laboratory for Arctic research, and I encourage all of you to be in contact with the Arctic Hub and ISAFIC, the Arctic Gateway, and the Greenland Climate Research Center. We also provide top quality sustainable seafood, which offers a better and healthier life. The Arctic is changing, and the world can actually learn from it and from Greenland, and we offer opportunities to build a better world. So, as you can see, climate change also means opportunities, and Greenland can play a key role in the green transition. But with all the green transition, we have to keep in mind that we must not give up our heritage, our culture, and identity. Arctic is also about the people. It is our people, it is our identity, it is our home. And these climate changes are already affecting our local community who depend on fishing, hunting, and their livelihood. This is why it is essential that we need to contribute to prevent and significant climate change. So ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. You have now seen how Greenland can save the world. We are plugged in, we are ready to interact, and Greenland offers opportunity to a Greenland transition and engage with us and get first-hand experience and knowledge on the Arctic conditions. 
and Greenland can offer green energy solutions and climate change mitigations, which are key issue for the government of Greenland. So now I will give the floor to my friend Malik Peter Koch Hansen, board member of Nunanut Aslanut Politik Ramna Mutberati Fik, the Greenland Foreign Policy Society. Malik, the floor is yours. Hello. Good morning. Ohayo um, I'm here on behalf of the Greenland Foreign Policy Society, Nunanut Aslanut Politik Ramna Mutberati Fik. Um, just a uh, quick post sample on the Jakob's uh, presentation it was a bit fast. But um, so this is about uh, Asia in, in the Arctic and uh, Greenland is uh, in the Arctic and uh, Japan is Asia. And we just want to say that uh, you have a special place in our hearts. We always think about our cousins that we call the Japanese. Um, and um, if you ever come to Greenland, I think you will find that the environment is very much suitable for Japanese um, investments because um, we very much uh, understand and sympathize with Japan. Uh, you will maybe find it easier than Europe or North America or China to invest in any project that uh, Jakob just talked about. <clears throat> so my subject is about the Inuit and the International Sea between Greenland and Canada. And it's just about how um, the Inuit navigate the international uh, area. Um, no Inuit has their own independent statehood, so we don't have direct um, representation in UN, for example. It has to go through the states like Denmark or Canada. So this is kind of how we navigate it. <clears throat> so the Inuit uh, live in the Arctic. Um, you can see the blue and then a little bit over in the green in uh, Chukotka. Um, span all the way across the Arctic. We have a similar culture, similar language and history. Um, for example, my name, Malik, means the same, all the way from the southern part of Greenland to the Elliot in the, in the top of there. So um, we have very similar um, people. Uh, so we, we call ourselves uh, Inuit, all of us. Uh, it's Inuit Nunad. The, the land of the Inuit. But to us, you are also Inuit because Inuit means humans. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, up until the 18th century, it was kind of a semi nomadic um, people. We would travel across uh, finding food and settling down and moving around. So Canada and Greenland wasn't specifically two separate countries, it was just Inuit Nunad. And um, yeah, my subject is about the two cases of international law uh, of the sea. <clears throat> so, this is an area, a country of extremes, both. Um, we have the longest maritime border in the world. It was already the longest maritime border in the world before 2022, but it's even longer now. So, this uh, black line you see is uh, 129 um, points that are connecting the meridian line between uh, Green uh, Greenland and Canada. Um, Canada has the longest coastal line in the world, 202 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, so it spans around the Earth uh, at the equator five times. Greenland is already uh, 44,000 kilometers, which is a larger coastal line than Russia. It's a very huge area to, um, to caretake. Uh, with a very uh, sparse population. We have the sparsest population uh, for the um, square feet or square kilometers per capita. Um, so this little blue dot, you see there's an island there. Um, it was a disputed area together with the green area and the squared out area in the Labrador Sea you see down there. Um, so. Maybe some of you have heard about Hans Island. Uh, I will talk a little bit about it. Um, so it's, in Greenlandic, it's called Tatubaluk, which means um, something that looks like a kidney. Uh, there's an agreement between the Danish government and the Canadian government and the Greenlandic government together signed uh, in June the 14th, 2022, uh, that resolved three boundary issues. and. Um, this was called uh, the, uh, a war between <laughs> two NATO countries, but it was not technically a war. I will show you why. So, uh, Tartubaluk is uh, around 1.3 kilometers um, 
square kilometers is a real, really, really tiny island uh, in the north um, of Greenland. And uh, it's been um, kind of a meme legend uh, over the internet these past 10 years. Um, it's super popular. The young people know about it. Uh, maybe you have heard about it in the news. Um, it's the place where the whiskey war happened. Denmark and Canada would take down the flag of the other country and put their own flag and put their own um, choice of uh, alcohol. <clears throat> so this was called the world's friendliest conflict or uh, the politest war in history. Uh, it ended in 2022, so uh, kind of a contrast to the um, Ukraine crisis. Um, Greenland and the Inuit has a very different view on, the, on conflict and militarization. So um, this was a dispute. It happened um, actually way back um, in 1933. Uh, the International Court of Justice for the League of Nations awarded Hans Island to Greenland. But uh, as it was called, the permanent court was uh, not permanent, and it ended in, in after the Second World War. So um, when the new uh, line, Meridian Line, was drawn between uh, Canada and Greenland, uh, it went through the island because it's situated exactly 12 nautical miles within the territorial sea of both Greenland and Canada. So they both had a claim to it, and um, that's uh, how the um, conflict started. <clears throat> but um, there was, a, as you see, a little, little bit hard to see, but there's a three, um, two foreign ministers and a prime minister signing the agreement uh, in the background of this picture, uh, this slide. But um, this was solved peacefully. It was solved with, uh, in accordance to international law and um, without uh, too many problems. So. Um, this is three, just three points. Uh, the, the new agreement added 50 new points to the um, territorial, uh, the maritime border between the two countries. I uh, should maybe a little bit quicker. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so just uh, in short, um, for Inuit, uh, international law is not, um, so we say nothing without us, uh, nothing about us without us, because uh, our um, uh, participation in international law is not a given. Uh, we don't have statehood. We don't have uh, our own independent representation in the UN, for example. But we, we have consultative status. For example, ICC can consult the uh, IMO and, and the UN on, on subjects. Um, and as I said, uh, uh, military is a little bit foreign to us. Um, so just to make it a little bit short, an another story about uh, how international law is affecting Greenland. Uh, this is the polar code. This is uh, how um, shipping is uh, regulated in the Arctic seas. Um, what ICC, for example, wants to consult IMO about is uh, that we want to include um, in this no new North and Northwest Passage, uh, the Inuit on the other side. ICC has chair is chaired by Greenland. Uh, at this moment, uh, but, um, but we have a solidarity with everybody in the Inuit Nunat, so uh, our suggestion would be that we include uh, all the Inuits uh, in Canada as well uh, within the Polar Code, for example. And I think, uh, in short, this is a win-win-win uh, case. Um, we can solve uh, international dispute uh, through peaceful means uh, in accordance with uh, international law. It's not impossible. <laughs> And um, that's the spirit of Inuit. It's in the Ilulissa Declaration. It's the in ICC protocols, how to engage with Inuit. And we wish uh, to inspire uh, everybody in the world that it's possible to do, uh, solve um, conflicts through peaceful uh, means and in accordance with all law and order in international states. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Rivior Lustram. What I see in my work, if you lose from this, never day on the good side, you lose going to get mass. It's so the translators know that they don't have to try to pronounce my name. <laughs> yes, um, I am here in my capacity of assistant professor of the University of Greenland, but also as the chair of the Human Rights Council of Greenland. What I had wanted to do was to talk about decolonization and what it actually means in Greenland, because I have encountered that also 
in the, around 2010, 2011, and also now, the word is being used by a lot of researchers and people, politicians, without any regard for what it actually means. But um, if we are to Google it, because that's what most of us do nowadays, it is about cultural and psychological and economic freedom for indigenous people with the goal of achieving indigenous sovereignty. The right and ability of indigenous people to practice self-determination over their land, culture, and political and economic system. And that sounds wonderful, but how do you put it into action? How do you implement it? And how about we say it's already ongoing? Greenland is a beautiful example of decolonization. You have just seen two Greenlandic men talk about what we are capable of in Greenland, how we are part of the political agenda internationally. Um, we have our own government. We had home rule first, and now we have our uh, self-government from 2009 till now. So we have achieved quite a lot when it comes to the legal part of becoming decolonized and started to take uh, back our own country. But it's also uh, the language we speak, the culture that we are keeping and that we are revitalizing. I have traditional Inuit tattoos. Uh, when my parents saw that I had them, they were quite shocked because their generation couldn't even think about having those kind of tattoos. It, it was inconceivable, so to speak. And so uh, we are the only Inuit uh, that still speak our own language as the majority. Uh, the rest of the Inuit in Inuit Nunat, as you saw on the map before, they mainly speak English and have lost their language in a very big way. And uh, Another part of it is, though, when we want to decolonize, we have to be able to discuss it. We have to be able to talk about the scars that colonization set upon Greenland. And uh, even though I'm very proud that we have our own language secretariat, we do not have a word for decolonization. We do not have a word for colonization of the mind, of being colonized as a person. Uh, that concept doesn't exist. And because of that, there cannot be a public debate in Greenland uh, about decolonization. So what we are doing from the Human Rights Council of Greenland is creating the terminology so that the Greenlandic people themselves can discuss and debate about their rights and their experience rather than having a Danish-speaking elite talk on behalf of the other maybe 80% of Greenland. So because of this, we also have internal uh, discourse that where people don't agree with each other. We have people that really want to decolonize uh, the culture and the language and really want to be an independent Greenland. Uh, and they are sometimes considered as radicalist and uh, in the public Facebook groups and debates, we use Facebook a lot in Greenland, uh, they're often referred to as decolonizing good, the decolonizers, as if they are not part of the public, as if they're something else. And that kind of showcases that we need to have these discussions because uh, we don't really realize how far we have come because our history books, for the most part, were written in Danish, by Danish historians. And so there was no actual uh, Greenlandic spirit, so to speak, in those books. Um, so when we talk about self-determination, it talks about our right to decide our own destiny in the international order. Uh, and we got that uh, in the uh, preamble of our Self-Government Act that we are recognized as a people. 
with, a, with the right for self-determination. And that was a wonderful uh, piece of progress. But even before that, we were actually really active internationally because uh, it was a Greenlandic woman who came with the suggestion that, it, that we needed a, a permanent forum for indigenous people under the UN. And she and a lot of uh, compatriots, both within the UN, in Denmark, and other indigenous peoples managed to create that forum that we still have every year. And a lot of other mechanisms for the rights of indigenous people, such as the ILO 169. So you see, even though we were not considered a, a people with the rights of self-determination, we managed to do quite a lot internationally, and we still do. And um, I, I, I wanted to highlight that because when I mentioned her name for my students at the University of Greenland last fall, none of them recognized her name. None of them knew what she had achieved, and none of them knew of how much Greenland had contributed to the international rights of indigenous peoples. And I am pretty sure that none of you who listen now knew either. So it is also important to showcase these things so that we can treat each other better, but also so we know our own words as indigenous people in Greenland and what and how far we have actually gotten in in uh, decolonizing ourselves because sometimes when we just say the word it's it's such a far away concept but when you see constructs that we see every year such as the forum and other places you you can kind of see that it is actually something tangible it is something that is going on and it will keep going on thank you so much Ms. Ulrik Pramgad, I'm a senior researcher at Danish, International, uh, Danish Institute for International Studies. But as speaking here, I, I think it's important to say that uh, I worked for the government of Greenland for, for some years ago. Uh, and uh, in that sense, I am a sympathetic analyst of the presentations uh, that, you, that you just heard. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly on why those of you who uh, go around to Arctic fora like this, but perhaps even more in, in more formal settings like the, the Arctic Council, why you sometimes might experience uh, a certain disorientation about when is Denmark speaking, when is Greenland speaking, when are Inuit speaking, what, uh, what, uh, who, who are we listening to, who are we talking to here? And I'm not going to do that in detail, but I'm going mainly to do so by explaining you this slide. Uh, and uh, the basic point is that in, at, at, as at the moment, there is a constitutional relation between uh, Denmark and Greenland. Um, its Danish name is Rigsfællesskabet. It's sometimes uh, translated into English as a commonwealth, but really that's not a very good translation. Uh, the, the, if you should do it more literally, it would be a community of the realm. And of course, that's in a sense an oxymoron, a, a, a really literally a realm, a ri, that's something hierarchical. There's a sovereign at the top and then there's subordinates below. But a community, that's something lateral, something maybe even cozy and nice uh, to be part of, the fiddlescape in, in Danish. Uh, and and this, this word doesn't have a huge uh, legal status uh, in, in Danish constitutional law, but it very much is the mental frame uh, for, for the relation, uh, uh, the, the legal relation between Greenland and Denmark. I included also the, the Greenlandic name. Uh, I'm not an expert in, Greenland, in the Greenlandic language, but Nalaga Fratiginer is even more cozy as I understand it. It's those who decide, but something we do together. So it's really uh, a translation of a hierarchical concept into something more communal, a lateral, 
uh, than 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 it's it's supposed to be in uh, in, in, in in Danish uh, law. So I included two pictures uh, below to illustrate how this works, this word, this community of the realm works in practice. Um, to the right, uh, I, I copy pasted uh, uh, a, a bit from a recent uh, Danish government foreign policy strategy uh, where it, it all, all the text talks about Danish interests, Danish values, Danish, uh, what, what Denmark should, should do. And then whenever we move into the Arctic, it, the Arctic, it doesn't say Denmark, it says the kingdom, which is uh, the, the, the official Danish name used when we're talking specifically about the community of the realm of the relation to, to Greenland. And then there are these, these little diagrams put in by the Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs Graphics Department. And, and that, if you look at that diagram, it, it, it's, it's not an obvious hierarchy. It's a, it's a kind of a network with three nodes, each with their own authority. Uh, and, and again, that's the way Danish politicians particularly, but also uh, in uh, the, the Danish state in, in general, promotes the community of the realm to, to, uh, to its own population, but also outside. But it's, it's a nice, uh, nice cozy uh, and, and lateral uh, relation. If we skip to the, to the picture at the left, uh, it is uh, a picture of our queen, Queen Margaret the Second, as a quite young woman, uh, and I think she's she's uh, in a sense trying her best to have a cozy relation to a young Greenlandic girl. But obviously, if you look at the Greenlandic girl, there's she feels a hierarchy still uh, in in that relation, uh, and and that's basically the the point here that I wanted with this slide that uh, the relation between Denmark and Greenland, I think most Danish officials really, really do a lot, uh, do an effort to make this as, as nice and equal as possible, but it just doesn't work because we have a, a, a common luggage uh, with us. And to engage that luggage, uh, Greenlanders take up a series of positions. Um, most of the time, uh, most politicians talk as if we will soon be an an, a, a sovereign state at other times, it's more efficient to, to take on uh, the speaking position of a, an indigenous people. Uh, and, and there are a lot of variations about how to make those two things work together. Uh, and that was all the rest of my slides were about that, but I'll, uh, I'll skip it in the interest of time just to let you go with this basic point that uh, Greenland and Denmark, it's a cozy relations, it's also a hierarchy, and Greenlanders are pretty pragmatic in how to get moving from that uh, hierarchy and, and uh, have their voice heard effectively in different fora. So please skip the rest of the slides. <laughs> I'll give the floor to uh, Klaus Georg Hansen, who had numerous positions in the Greenlandic government. Now he's an, uh, an, an analyst, a researcher based at the Danish Institute for International Studies. Yes. Good morning. Well, yes, it's here. Good. Um, I will echo some of this, some of what has been to, uh, said already, uh, not least what Rivjok uh, has been uh, touching upon. Uh, I have... Uh, right. <laughs> yes, good. Um, I have done a, shor uh, a short um, study recently I have been involved in the discussions and public debates for more than 40 years in Greenland, um, and I have noticed that there were some kind of um, changes recently, and uh, I have been curious to see what kind of visions that actually has been uh, on stage in the, in the debates in Greenland uh, which, what they are now, and um, the way I've done it is that I have uh, chosen a few key uh, persons to interview and set up a typology for the uh, visions for uh, the future of Greenland. And, well, uh, the one uh, line here is the, the Horizontal, 
it goes uh, from uh, status quo in one end to change in another way. And on the constitutional focus on, on how should the relationship be between Greenland and Denmark. And on the other line, uh, the focus of uh, legitimacy has been either on the uh, legislation or on discourse or the norms in the society. And it gives us altogether four uh, different way, uh, points of view. By the way, uh, the, the picture here, it's uh, a ver very well-known uh, hunter from the very most northern part of Greenland, uh, Siwap Baduk. Uh, he moved to Siwap Baduk 50 years ago. His name is Iku Ushima, and he is actually from Japan. And he's living up there, has made a family up there, and he's very well known and a very clever hunter. Well, uh, for the, from the uh, interviews, I have uh, been able to identify these four uh, different ways of looking at the future for Greenland. Uh, if we start up in the upper uh, left, uh, uh, there is an argument for the nationality for independence. Uh, they are discussing it, uh, the, they are taking the debate. Uh, they want to have some changes uh, on the legislative um, level. So, and, and the um, vision is to have independence at some point. On the right side up, uh, there is a very clear argument around the economy. Uh, and uh, those who, who raise that argument is uh, typically uh, interested in having a status quo between Greenland and Denmark on the uh, constitutional level. And they are also discussing it from a legislative point of view. Then to the uh, left uh, in, the, in the lower uh, corner, there is a, uh, a point of view from uh, people who want to keep the status quo not so much on the legislative uh, level, but more on the discourse level as they uh, stress the importance to keep the uh, Christianity as a uh, important part of the um, society in Greenland. So they are having an interest in having an status quo or uh, a, on the discourse level. And then the fourth one uh, to the uh, right lower corner, uh, there is an argument about how to uh, strengthen the Inuit culture. Uh, and they are, as Ribiot mentioned, they are uh, often mentioned as uh, people who want to, uh, to, who wishes decolonization. Um, you can say that they are all kind of um, norm entrepreneurs. Uh, the Christianity argument is the oldest one. You saw that very clearly 100 years ago in Greenland. Uh, around the uh, 1950s, there was this economy uh, argument as a entrepreneurial um, um, discussion. Before the home rule and the self-government uh, that we have now, it was primarily arguments uh, from the nationality uh, discourse, you can say, uh, and um, they have achieved all this that we have today. The new on the scene is this, the decolonization uh, argumentation. And they are um, very active, and they are, uh, it's that my uh, study here does not say anything about how much um, um, support do they each of them have, but they have uh, uh, 
they're really visible uh, in the debates as it is today. And I will, in the name of uh, time, I will skip the next here, just to make some, uh, well, very shortly. Uh, it was a, a very um, uh, common agreement that Greenland saw itself as ahead of the Inuits in, in Canada from the uh, nationality point of view because we have a more uh, advanced uh, negoti um, agreement with the government in Denmark. But now, oh, sorry, uh, but now uh, the colonization uh, argument is that Inuit in Canada are ahead of Greenland because they have a much closer connection to the Inuit culture. So we actually are looking into that now. And for the uh, statue of the missionary Hans Jill, who started the mission in Greenland in 1721, uh, there are also different views on whether to keep that statue or to get rid of that what statue. So that's what, my, what I would have to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, ten minutes remain, so when I have no specific comment uh, on the substance of this session, but uh, I, yes, I'm not sure I should say something here, but um, I do have uh, concerns that is uh, more in the framework of this session in relation to this position of mine. And this is not teasing you, but that. Uh, I am a Japanese, but my identity is more complex than my nationality, right? So and I'm somewhat hesitant to define me only as Japanese, but, but I'm Japanese, so um, how can I talk about future vision of Greenlanders? I mean, the Greenlanders of future vision. Can I, can I talk about it? Yes, of course, I can talk about it, but how ki what kind of text will it be and what kind of context will it be connected to for my counterparts, I mean that five panelists. And this is what I'm now thinking about after I hear your um, I mean, presentation. But uh, we don't have enough time to discuss these things. So if anyone has any brief comment to this, please, but if not, we would like to move on to the uh, QA sessions. But, um, or does anyone has uh, any comment to this? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that uh, you should just engage the, engage the Inuit and have an open discussion, uh, heart to heart. And I think you would be able to represent what they have to say just as well as they could. Yeah, uh, of course you can always uh, write about it, but you cannot write on behalf of us. That is the thing. And, uh, and also, I would suggest that any researcher who wants to do research in Greenland should always uh, look at the ethical point of view. What, what is your positioning? And what is the position of the people that you're visiting? And again, uh, like I mentioned before on another stage, was about research fatigue. Do not ask the same question again and again. So if you know of research that has been done in a similar way, perhaps, uh, consider working together with the researcher who has done similar work and, uh, and use some of their data sets before you try to do something else, of course. That would be a good suggestion from my side. Okay, th thank you, great. Uh, so, um, it's okay, five minutes remain, so uh, probably we, I'd like to move on to the QA session. So, uh, please raise your hand and please state your name and affiliation uh, before asking your questions. So, uh, please. Yes, good morning. My name is Pieter Ausgerson. I'm the Arctic ambassador of Iceland. Uh, a very prominent Greenlander uh, that I had a discussion with uh, earlier this week uh, suggested that in Greenland there are maybe two most pressing uh, things that have to be considered. On one hand, uh, education, and on the other hand, the build-up of uh, the Greenland economy. And to me, uh, the, the, in the core of both of these is the language. Of course, as uh, in Iceland, you, I mean, we had to 
make sure we kept the Icelandic language, you have to preserve the Greenlandic language, but what are your, uh, 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 how do you feel about uh, a second language? Is that Danish or perhaps another language? Thank you very much for this very important question. Um, I think I will try to do it very short, but it's a very complex uh, question. When you're talking about also most, some of the most pressing questions in Greenland, we talked about climate change, we talked about culture, we talk about language and so on. From my point of view, it sounds maybe a bit of a paradox, but uh, and I'm not neglecting climate change uh, or anything else, but we Greenlanders, we are world champions in climate change, in ad adaptability, in migration, in mitigation. We have survived in the Arctic for 4,000 years. We have survived all kinds of changes. We have survived different kinds of colonization across the Arctic. Uh, so in my view, one of the most pressing issues is actually how we are going to deal with the future. Because as you saw in the presentation, there's no limits on how much we want to engage with the rest of the world. We are building new airports. Uh, we want to have more research. We want to do basically everything, huge mining projects, simple mining projects and so forth. And all this, uh, for all this you need people, you need workers. And we have to be realistic. We are only 56,000 people in Greenland. And right now, as you have heard, we have a lot of discussions, internal discussions, very difficult discussions about language, about culture, about identity in Greenland, already between Denmark and Greenland. So how are we going to deal about it in the future with the immigration uh, when we are going to have many workers coming to Greenland, not only from Denmark, but also from uh, Eastern European countries, from Asian countries who doesn't speak Danish, who doesn't speak Greenlandic, uh, who doesn't speak English, how are we going to integrate that into the future? What kind of society do we want to have in the future to create the Greenland that we want to do so we are in control of that ourselves? So we take the decision ourselves so we can try to steer it. I know it's very difficult, but I think it's a thing that we need to discuss internally in the society and among the political uh, debates that we have in the parliament. How are we going to create the country we want to create? And I think uh, that will be a very pressing issue uh, we will have to deal with in the future. Uh, I suggest we just quickly take the two last questions and uh, we'll get some quick answers. Three, maybe two, three. Uh, I'm, I'm Liu Dan. I'm from Dan Liu. I'm from Shanghai Jiao University. Uh, actually, the question. Uh, for the female speaker. <laughs> I really appreciate that you mentioned about decolonization or determination, those uh, legal terms, because for international lawyers, this terminology are very important. So my question is very short. I want to know in which way domestic, original, or international approach, in which way do you think uh, these are important? Which way is important to, to get a recognition from the, uh, from the legal level uh, for indigenous people. So that is, uh, I think that, that that's just simple, the question. And, uh, and just, uh, can we have the last question quickly? Several years ago, US President Donald Trump proposed to purchase Greenland. Do any of you want to be purchased? <laughs> I'm uh, Tim Shirk from Alaska, just wondering. All right, um, I'll answer very first the first question and then I'll come over here. Um, we, as an educator, I can say that 80% of our students at the university are female. And, uh, and the predictions that we can see from the statistic of Greenland is pretty much the same. So Malik is actually very exceptional that he's here with us. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, you we have to then think about wages and gender equality as well in the workforce because right now it's very much made for for men uh, so uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff we need to rearrange but i also wanted to mention we have extremely many filipinos and uh, thai people in greenland and they after spending one year in greenland speak pretty fluent greenlandic 
We don't see that from the Danish side. So uh, I'm not worried about people from Asia coming and not learning our language. Um, so uh, when it comes to the legal part of this, it's kind of paradoxical because we want to be seen as the indigenous people that we are. But uh, uh, there's parts of uh, the legal framework that you see everywhere, for example, when it comes to whaling, that kind of ensures that if we do become a state, then we cannot whale the same way that we do as in indigenous peoples because then our rights would be different. So there is something in the international framework that needs to be done, not necessarily under the UN, but under the organizations under them that we need to kind of satisfy to be able to be seen as respectable people who, who hunt what we do. And uh, also know uh, I was part of the people who sent the reply to President Trump. So <laughs> thank you for, for that reminder. <laughs> Yeah, um, I can just quickly answer that. The, our prime minister at the Arctic Circle a couple of years ago answered that, and he said, uh, we are not for sale, but we are open for business. Um, I want to thank the Japanese government and the ministers and the representatives of foreign, uh, yeah, foreign uh, representative uh, ambassadors and uh, yeah, parliamentarians. Um, the Arctic Circle uh, Secretariat, uh, Olaf Ragnar Grimson, Amazing uh, Japanese uh, Japan Forum, uh, very well put together. Um, lots of uh, experts, uh, very democratic um, setting. Thank you.